Hi, welcome to Really Famous. I'm Kara, and today I'm bringing you a talk with internationally renowned psychologist Dan Goleman, who catapulted to fame when he wrote the book Emotional Intelligence 25 years ago, and he stayed in the spotlight making the science of psychology super accessible. He was also a science journalist for the New York Times and the editor-in-chief of Psychology Today, and he is hot on the lecture circuit. So Dan is not my typical guest, but we definitely get into a trademark topic of really famous, psychology. It is so fascinating. Dan and I analyze people's behaviors and habits, and we do it together because while I'm far from having his level of expertise, my background includes being a therapist. So today is really fun. We analyze what happens in conversations, what we do when people say negative things about us, self-talk, texting, Zooming, celebrities who I've interviewed, and my reactions to some of them, and my own peculiar habits. I also share details on my work as a writer for the New York Times and WebMD. And by the way, there is a huge take home for you. It's like the big therapists and coaches secret to shifting your life in a powerful direction. We reveal it, so stay tuned. Oh, and emotional intelligence, by the way, is different from IQ. It involves empathy, self-awareness, managing your emotions, and putting it all together in your relationships. And it can be a key to how successful you are in life. It can make your relationships flourish and turn you into a star in the workplace. We get into how it works and how you can make it work for you. Today's episode is sponsored by My Amazon Storefront. So if you're going to shop on Amazon, whether you're getting something that you already planned on buying or you want to check out some really fun and cool things that I have found on Amazon that I think you'll like. Yes, a lot of them involve television and film, but others are just some of my favorite things. Either way, if you visit Amazon through my link and you buy something, Amazon will give us a small advertising fee. So it's a great way to support the show. It doesn't cost you anything. It's super easy. Just click on the link in today's show notes or go to amazon.com slash shop slash really famous. And I thank you in advance for helping the show. Another thing to check out is Dan's new podcast, which he hosts with his son. It's called First Person Plural, Emotional Intelligence and Beyond. And now Dan Goleman and me, let's go. When I have my guests on, I normally get into a lot of psychological topics sure. and sure. there's a lot of analyzing going on. And so I thought you were really a perfect fit. I think a lot of people who listen to the show or watch it on YouTube We'll be into it. So wh where are you? In, in the city or you're in New York or where? I'm in the Burbs. I'm in New Jersey. I live in Bergen County, which is like oh, over the river. We're neighbors. I'm in Palisades. It's just over the line. Oh, we are neighbors. We could have seen each other in person. That's <laughs> yeah, right. fine. Well, hello, neighbor. <laughs> so, so, hello, neighbor. Good to know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, all right. So we're neighbors. So that's fun. Um, I have a question for you because when people hear me or they find out that I was a therapist, they often uh -huh. think that I'm analyzing them as they talk or that I have already analyzed them. Right. Do you have a similar experience? Yeah, it's really a strange projection that people have on the image of a psychotherapist, that somehow you have this inside information or this uh, special ability to psych them out and that you're doing it right now, which I think is usually not true. Not true for me. I don't know about you. No, it's not true for me either. I am certainly not analyzing them. I mean, if they ask me to analyze a situation, I will. Or uh -huh. if they ask or if they tell me about a dream, I might analyze that. Not well, that I know so what I'm talking about. What is your orientation as a psychotherapist? So I had a very eclectic. A so I'll give you a little background. I, um, before I, became a therapist. I My undergrad is actually in accounting, but that's who even cares about that. I knew I didn't like it. I went to grad school. I went to Columbia and I got a master's in developmental psychology. So um, I didn't go total clinical all the way. And when I started my practice after that, 
I just started seeing people with like problems of living, relationship issues, self-esteem issues, and I took a little bit from here, a little bit from there, and uh, I'd say insight-oriented therapy Pretty mostly. eclectic. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I have a very similar background. I got a master's in developmental psych. Oh. I was at Harvard, and I was in the clinical psych program, but I got um, sidetracked. I got hijacked into writing about it. And back in the day when there was a real magazine called Psychology Today, I became an editor there and started recruiting psychologists to write about their work for a larger public. And then that led me to the Times, the science desk of the New York Times, uh, where basically I became a science journalist with psychology as my expertise. That's very interesting to me. And I have all that written down because I did want to ask you about that, too. So I had a different path too that didn't really take me directly to where I am, but it all makes sense that it all came together for like this purpose. Oh. By the way, we also have the times in common. I didn't write like you did, but I was a contributor. I would write a lot of the Sunday routine. You know the Sunday routine column that runs uh, every Sunday in the Metropolitan section where they talk about anybody, who, some person who lives in New York, any of the five boroughs oh, yeah. and what they oh, do on a typical about? Sunday. Yeah, so I've written a bunch. I've written maybe 30 of those or something over the years. Uh What do you do on a Sunday in New York? Exactly. And of course, so I was a journalist before I started the podcast. Um, But that would be a lot of what I would gravitate towards. Of course, I would interview, not surprisingly, actors who lived in New York or fashion gurus who lived in New York, but famous people generally. I thought it was pretty interesting to see what they did on a Sunday. It's kind of a natural segue for you from that to this podcast. Yeah, yeah. So that was it, right? I mean, it does, it's a natural segue, but at the same time, it's kind of like, wait, what? You were what, you did what? Like some people don't realize I was even a therapist, but yeah, that's that was my progression. Um, but it does make sense, but it is interesting because psychology today, I find that very interesting because it's like for laymen, right? So anybody can read psychology today and understand the concepts that they're, that they're fascinated by, right, without it being too technical or burdened with scientific jargon or that sort of thing. I think I feel like it's sure. a very positive thing for the general public to have access to that. What do you think? Well, that was what actually pulled me into the role of science journalism, because I really felt I was an educator. Both my parents were like teachers college teachers. And um, I liked the idea of, so I had this expertise in reading journal articles. Nobody wants to read a psychology journal article, except another psychologist, maybe. But I could translate that for a wider audience. And there's value in that. Because there was a lot of practical information, there's a lot of news to use in those articles. And that really was my motivation was trying to share psychological insight, psychological knowledge with a general audience, because you never know who's going to find it really meaningful for them. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, and that's that's really so the art was always right about it so that the person or the 10 people who are experts on the field aren't going to complain that you got it wrong, but make it interesting enough that people will want to read it who don't know anything about it. That's totally. the art. I I appreciate that. So on the side, just because I was a journalist, I still am. You know, I don't think of myself as a journalist as much as a writer, but Uh, I write uh for WebMD. So I've done that for years. And it's that same concept of I have to get information. I need to research a topic and I need to read some of these journals. I'm not reading them in depth by all means. I'm not doing that, but I do have to sift through them and see what the latest things show you. And I have to interview experts and then bring it to the easy to understand language. It's tricky, but I think it's I think you're doing a great job. I don't know. I don't think you sign them on WebMD, do you? Your byline's not. No. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, it is. My my byline is there. Unless it's at the at the top, usually. Yeah. Oh, at the top. So I love WebMD because it's so interesting and accessible. You're doing a great job. Now I'm going to look for your name next time I do a WebMD. It just catches my attention. You know, I get it in my newsfeed. 
Oh. Yeah. Okay, yeah. you will definitely now see my name, and I'll also tell you. Do you get the print magazine also, or no? No, in the mail? no, just uh, so online. That, there's a print magazine, and they usually leave it in doctor's offices. So there might be a stack of magazines you can pick up and <laughs> free. So I oh, have written many cover stories with celebrities, but with a health issue. So like, let's mm -hmm. say um, I'm blanking out, but I did like Kevin Hart was one of the people I interviewed. I did a cover story about him and I think it was a mental health issue that I was bringing to the surface and uh Padma you know Padma Lakshmi from yes, uh, her. Top Chef yes. her. so if you if you flip through the magazine you would definitely see my name in the middle of it but now that I know you're looking online you have to let me know you have to be like Kara I just read this article that you wrote <laughs> and you know I don't like this what you said or <laughs> Usually I love it though, so don't worry. Okay, okay. <laughs> but I do appreciate that. I think there's value in that for people who want information and don't want to have to sift through the journals, like the real, that's the thing about science, right? Is that it, it's, it can be so fascinating, but I think to people who aren't scientifically inclined, it's a little that's bit right. hard to right. grasp or to they, stick with. They need the translation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly, yeah. So interesting. So we have a lot of things that we're that we're very, we have in common now. Yeah, so tell me about this. I'm very interested in these assessments. So and we'll talk about. I want to talk about emotional intelligence, and we'll, we'll get into some of the concepts of it in a okay. second. But yeah. what do you think of like the Myers Briggs inventory and those kinds of assessments? Do you have a, an opinion? Thumbs up, thumbs down, a little bit of both. Well. Uh, the Myers-Briggs is interesting because from a technical point of view, it doesn't have any validity. There's no, you know, I don't know if you know this, but it wasn't based on research. It was based on a Jungian uh, model. On the other hand, it's been used so much that there's a lot of outcome data that makes sense of it. So it, okay. it can be useful. I don't know what other personality inventories you have in mind. That's the one. Uh, oh, that's, that's the, the one. one. Yeah, yeah. I remember okay. when uh, I... I've never seen it. I've never taken it. Do you use it? So I remember when I... I don't know where I came across it, but somebody exposed me to or showed me maybe I took it I'm not sure like a mini version of it this is going years years back and I remember mm -hmm. taking it and thinking this is so fascinating and then of course the result it comes up with the personality type I think there are 16 16 types right they mix different right. characteristics right. and I remember of course thinking like oh this is totally me but of course that or is that the same thing as what happens when you're reading your horoscope and it's like, oh, yeah, that's me. And there's absolutely no basis for that. Yeah. Do, you know um, the Enne uh, do you know the Enneagram system? It's a little yeah, so similar. That's seven similar. Types, or nine seven types. types. Okay. Okay. So now does so. that have more? Oh, wait, before I ask you that question, then let me back up to the, the, something you said, which was, so it has no validity, but because so many people have done it, there's information. So what is the information? Do you know well, off the top of your head? No, I don't know much about it. Uh, when I say it has no validity, it, it didn't have any validity at the beginning. It was put together theoretically, but it wasn't tested. In other words, there, there's a way of validating a, uh, an assessment technically where you are validated at several stages. One of the last stages is well, does it predict something? And many, many people are very pleased to get their Myers-Briggs typology. It kind of makes sense. It's like knowing you're a Capricorn. Yeah. Is there technical validity to the concept of Capricorn? Well, from a scientific point of view, no, not at all. It, but there's a kind of consensual, like, oh, yeah, so I'm a... Uh, I, I can't remember the Myers Briggs types. Okay. Um, tell me, but it's helpful for people to see how they fit. There may be a little Barnum effect going on there. Now, what's the Barnum effect? The Barnum effect refers to P.T. Barnum, the guy who was a great showman who uh, would take anything and make people pay to see it. Mm -hmm. 
because he was so good at selling it. And uh, the Barnum effect is that uh, you give a general uh, personality assessment and you kind of make it up. Like you're very outgoing, but sometimes you feel shy. And, you know, you're, you usually are very certain of your feelings, but sometimes you don't feel you can express it. <laughs> They're basically phrases that apply to almost anyone. But you put it in a so I don't know how much of the Myers Briggs is uh, Barnum, and I don't know how much is really good science. I'm That's not that very clever, with it. right? To, to but, have yeah, the, the same old things, right? To have the yeah, same old things, like oh uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Then you can fit it, and um, many horoscopes are kind of like that. Like almost anybody could say, yeah, that's me. There's an art to that kind of description. I put together with a colleague of mine who's um, in the business school at Case Western an assessment for emotional intelligence. It's called the Emotional Social Competence Inventory. And this guy is really rigorous. So he did every kind of validation as we went along. And he still continues to validate it with outcome data. So there's hard assessments and there's soft assessments. Gotcha. So what is your hard assessment? What is it? How is it used? Who uses it? And what does it tell them? Okay. So the emotional social competence inventory uh, evaluates you on behavioral measures, meaning other people can see it too, of emotional intelligence. Like under stress, you flip out or you're pretty calm. People can see that and you can assess it yourself. So you assess yourself on 12 different dimensions of emotional intelligence, uh, my self-awareness, my, my ability to manage my emotions, keep my disruptive emotions under control, be positive, be adaptable, keep my eye on my goal, my ability to empathize, tune into other people, my ability to be influential and persuasive or get along on a team, things like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, you ask people who you know and trust to evaluate you anonymously. That's called the 360 degree assessment. And you don't know who said what, but you get that all averaged together and you get a profile. Oh, I'm really great at empathy. I'm not so good at handling disruptive emotions. So and then it's it's designed to use like a coach might use it with you to help you get better at what you want to improve on. So it's like going to a doctor and getting a physical. My triglycerides are high and my, you know, this kind of cholesterol is low, but that's, you know, like that. You get yeah. 10 different things. Yeah. And you that's see, so interesting. Well, it's such useful I'll... information to know these things about yourself because they apply to like every aspect of life. They do. And there's a bonus here. I think it was Robert Burns, the Scottish poet, said, oh, that the gods is the gift would give us to see ourselves as others see us. It's very rare that we get honest feedback about how, the, how people close to us see us. That's a, that's a special, I think, value added to get right. that information. Yeah. It's interesting. I, I heard somebody ask a question recently on a podcast, of course. And the question was, if you had to choose one of these two things, which would you choose? So one of them was either you hear all of the things that people have said about you over the years, or all the people who you've said things about hear what you've said about them. Right, and which <laughs> reminds me of that. <laughs> That's very funny. Which would you choose? So I asked choose? them. I, I, I would I'd have to choose, right? You have to choose. I asked yeah. my family this question too. And oh. so I have three kids and a husband. So I asked, uh, who did I ask first? I think I asked my two sons first and they both had the same answer. They both said they'd rather hear what everyone says about, about them, them or said about them. Yeah. And I would think that I'd be the kind of person who would say that, but I feel like, I don't know, this sounds terrible. I feel like this is terrible that I don't want to know, but oh no, is that going to ruin my self-esteem if I hear all these terrible things that everybody said about me? Uh, so that's right. what I said. That's what I chose. Interesting. What so about you? You did choose to hear. I would li I'd like to know what people are saying, I think. Yeah. I, and um, I think I take it with a grain of salt. 
I hope. I don't know. <laughs> I think that's if it good. Were I really think that's possible. If there's a right answer, I think that's the right answer. But I do feel like if I'm being honest, I feel like I do, wouldn't want to be like have a barrage of negative things come at me. What does well, it say about me? You're I assuming there'd be a lot of negatives. That's interesting because I'm thinking, oh, the, yeah, unconsciously, I, I'm unpacking my thought process. I think I'm assuming it's there's a lot of positives in there. But I think the I think the question, and maybe I didn't say it as I it, I told you, but I oh. think the question was oh, you hear, you're gonna hear all the bad things that people have said about you, or, or all, all the bad or they're things. gonna right, or they're gonna hear all the bad oh, things yeah. that you said about them. That would probably make me very defensive and angry. Yeah. <laughs> hearing all the bad things. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. why that? Yeah. The nerve. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> it's so interesting. And, I mean, but, the, yeah. but look, your inventory measure, it looks at the input of other people. So that is important to get. Yeah. And I do listen to feedback from what I hear. I, I like feedback. And yet I don't think I'd want to. I think I feel like you. Like I, I wouldn't want to hear all the negative things because some of the negative things aren't about us. Right. They're projections of other people. It, yes. Yes. <laughs> So there's a kind of difference. The feedback that you get on this 360 that I designed is not necessarily negative. You could take it as a negative, but we like to position it as news to use. This is the way you're coming off. And you don't know it. But do you want to do anything about it? Because we always have the possible, we, we hold uh, in the forefront the possibility that people can improve because we know people can. Sure. They work on it. You can become more empathic. You can become better at managing your distressing emotions. So that's actually good news. So I, I see it as news to use, not news to condemn yourself. Yes, with. yes, yes. yes. That's <laughs> you know, a difference. Feed you're right. Self esteem. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, yeah. right. But you're right. You, you need to feed it back to people very carefully because, we, you know, our go to place is probably like, oh, I'm no good. You know, the negative self-esteem i think that's true i think that's the go-to for most people even healthy people and i do think you know you don't always see it on the surface but i do think most people struggle with that and that is their default is to think there's something wrong with them there's a brain reason for that oh. it has to do with a structure called the amygdala which is the brain's radar for threat and negativity. If if so, if you hear someone say something negative about you, uh, the amygdala magnifies the importance of that information to you. Like, oh my God, there's something I need to pay attention to here, and it tends to fixate your attention on that negative thing. That's why you keep ruminating about it, because maybe so now the yeah. positive benefit of rumination which is loop tape looping, like I can't stop thinking about that thing, is that maybe you'll find something you can do. That's a positive function. The negative function is if you only loop, if you only worry, and you never find anything to do, then you're, you're going to be obsessed with this thing that's a downer for you. You'll wake up two in the morning thinking about it. Right. That's so interesting. And I do think people. there's a lot of people who – deal with rumination and they don't even know what, they don't know the word rumination. They don't understand it's uh, cycling or well, circling over and over and over the same thoughts. Um, but it is interesting that there is a biological reason for it, but it's so, it can get out of hand, of course. And it's one of the hallmarks of anxiety, right? Yeah, anxiety is over worrying. It's helpful to worry about something you can do something about. It's not helpful to worry about something you can't do. I once heard the Dalai Lama say, if you can do something about it, why worry? If you can't do something about it, why worry? <laughs> it's like a totally different <laughs> attitude. <laughs> but we worry. And if you keep worrying and you can't do anything about it, it's worrying uselessly. That's going to make you, that's what causes anxiety. That's where you get stressed out. Right. That actually can lead to emotional exhaustion. It's really unhealthy. And this is what got me interested in meditation, by the way, because I saw I spent uh, almost two years in India and uh, studying meditation, getting to know people who are like heavy duty meditators. And I realized that they're very cooled out. They were not stressed and that there was a relationship 
So when I went back to do my doctoral dissertation, I want to do it on meditation and stress. Meditation is a way of handling stress. This was way too early. They thought this was at Harvard. They thought this was a really bad idea. <laughs> like they were like, this is a hack idea, we, right? I yeah, guess they didn't no, think no, it was. It was like, no, they thought it was just like uh, irrelevant. You know, career ending was a term that was used. So, but now there's more than a thousand articles in, in technical journals a year on how this all works. You know, it's become a big fad. It's like yoga, mindfulness everywhere. Uh, and, and there's very good science behind it actually now. But back then it was like crazy. So anyway, what it does is make you less likely to be triggered by something like someone saying something negative about you. If you are triggered, it's less intense than it was before, and you're more likely to recover quickly. The, the technical definition of resilience is how quickly you recover from being upset. And it turns out that this changes your physiology and makes you more uh, stress resilient. That is Not so to get interesting. too technical. Isn't it interesting? Yeah. It is interesting. And just to get, I don't know if I'm getting technical. I guess I'm probably not. I don't usually get technical anyway. But a lot of the research I've done for WebMD, I'm telling you that meditation, and I can only write things that are backed by, you know, experts or research. Sure. So, sure. or, you know, I'll say something like, you know, research isn't clear yet. But meditation, right. the n number of times that meditation has come up as beneficial to your health, not just your mental health, but to your physical right. health for so many different physical conditions. I can't even count, it's like the thing to do. Um, a lot of scientific support, like you said. One reason is, so I, I just wrote a book reviewing the best research on meditation it's called uh, Altered Traits. My co-author is a neuroscientist at Wisconsin. He did a He's done lots of different studies on meditation, but one was really interesting. He had people who are so-called long-term meditators come in and meditate for one day. And he assayed their genome, and he found that it, uh, I'm going to say something technical, it down-regulated their inflammatory genes, which means that the genes in the body, which create chronic inflammation, which is at cause for a whole range of disorders, as WebMD will tell you, arthritis, diabetes, heart disease, cancers, all of these, uh, that they become inactive. So it, I think that may be one reason, one of the uh, trajectories by which meditation helps with health. That's so interesting. Yeah, I, I'll look for your WebMD article about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sure. You could there. probably, <laughs> yeah, you could probably search Kara Mayer Robinson WebMD <laughs> meditation. That can be your yeah, grouping. Right. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> See how often it comes out. Yeah. I bet it's but, a lot. Know, it shows up all over the place for that reason, I think. Yeah. yeah. So that is so interesting. So emotional intelligence generally, I know people probably ask you the same question over and over again, but I think the thing to note is that's the, that maybe the best segue into it is that people who tend to be uh, have an emotional intelligence I, I'm probably saying that not even phrasing this properly mm -hmm. but people with a high EQ let's say do you call it an EQ or no I don't use the term but I understand it okay okay yeah, then I'm sure. gonna I'm gonna wipe that well, out the reason I that. don't is that it kind of equates it with IQ but it's but it's several different things that's why I like to distinguish them. okay so that's you have important a profile to know. of emotional intelligence mm -hmm. Okay. You could be really good at self-awareness, but not so good at empathy. You could be really good at empathy and not so good at managing your disturbing emotions. You could be really good at keeping your eye on the goal, no matter what happens, but not a very good team player. So it's, it's a, a number of different things under one frame. Yeah. Right. Okay. So yeah. it's a profile. So there are many different aspects of it that you can look at. Sure. And it can right. be there are a couple of things about it, like it's it it can be improved upon. So you can improve upon your emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. It can be taught. It sure. can be learned. And sure. some people, though, certain aspects of it, I guess, come more naturally than others. Some people just happen to be more naturally empathic, if you want to say, or good at emotional mm -hmm. regulation or whatever the mm -hmm. aspects of it, the characteristics are, I mm -hmm. think, I imagine, right? Am I wrong or yes? 
No, I think that's true. For example, women on average tend to be better than men at empathy. Uh, that's just a, a, you know, a difference, biological difference, probably. Uh, we talk to girls about relationships much more than we talk to boys about relationships. Mm-hmm. So girls grow up being more attuned to the intricacies of relationships uh, than, uh, you know, uh, women are more attuned to that than men, generally. Uh, men tend to be better at managing upsets than women. On average, this doesn't mean that a given woman couldn't be better than men at handling upsets or given men better at empathy than most women. But this on average. Yes. Right. And of course, it sort of perpetuates itself. Right. Even if there's a natural inclination towards one or the other or the way that we raise kids and society. Sure. It impacts it, maybe reinforces well, it. Yeah, and culture and, and your family culture is important. I'm told in Thailand, for example, men are more sensitive, more empathic than in America. I don't know if it's true, but I can see how it might be true. From family to family, yeah, every family is its own culture. Yeah. So you learn how to express emotions. Um, I, I have a friend. Paul Ekman, who is the world's expert on the facial expression of emotions. He knew how every muscle moves for every emotion. And he could read, you know, he could tell if you're lying, for example, by watching your face. And he said when he met the Dalai Lama, he was struck by the fact that he didn't suppress any emotion, any emotion. He said I'd, he'd never seen a face that expressed freely the entire range of emotion. Because every family and every culture emphasizes some emotions and ignores or suppresses other emotions. So we learn how to do that. It's fascinating, really, isn't it? Yes. It's very interesting. Yes. Yeah. So within my personal family, (laughs) I have sensitive Mm -hmm. men in my family, starting with my dad and my kids, too. You know, that's just, but again, it runs Uh down. And my mom is too. So I guess a lot of it does, you know, it depends on society, but mostly the family unit that you're growing up with. Well, it would be hard to separate genetics from environment in your family's case. Mm-hmm. We would need twins of everyone in your family <laughs> that we raised differently to tell. Right. But uh, yeah, lucky you. Yeah, separated twins, I, right? Yeah, no, lucky me. Yeah. But separated twins at yes. birth, right? They're they're invaluable to science. There should be more. There should oh, be more fantastic twins. Fantastic for science. Right. Too bad. <laughs> Too bad there aren't more separated twins at birth. Yeah. birth. Exactly. It's so funny. So, but the people yeah. who tend to be most successful, and I've heard you say this before, and I know you, this is one of the fundamental things about emotional intelligence is. Many people who are successful in life aren't necessarily the ones with the highest IQs. They're the ones with the highest emotional intelligence. Is that accurate? Uh, Yeah, and the relationship between IQ and emotional intelligence is really interesting. I think uh, in order to be uh, like to get a master's like you have, in order to get an MBA, to be a physician, to be a lawyer, you need a certain level of IQ maybe 115, 120 minimum, which is what's called a standard deviation above the norm, which is 100. But once you're in that profession, once you're in the game, everyone else has the same level of IQ as you do. And what matters is how you manage yourself, how you handle your relationships, how you get along, how you collaborate with you, good team player. That has very little or nothing to do with your IQ. There was a study done um, by my colleague, Richard Boyatzis. He's at Case Western. He asked engineers at a global manufacturing company to evaluate other engineers. How effective is that engineer as an engineer? And it turned out there was zero correlation with IQ and a very high correlation with their emotional intelligence. Why? Because they were able to persuade people their ideas were good. They were able to get along well with other people. They are able to collaborate. You know, no one in engineering works alone anymore. Software, it's like a team sport. Yeah. And you have to be able to be a team player. So that's what distinguishes people. And leadership is all about emotional intelligence. 
So if you're going to emerge as a leader wherever you work or whatever you do, it doesn't depend on your IQ. In fact, there's interesting data that shows people who have really high IQs often turn off other people. They're too cool. They come off as off. They don't know how to talk to people in a way people understand. But part of being emotionally intelligent is being able to understand how the person I'm talking to thinks about this thing and the language they use, how they feel about it. You're picking that up all the time. And you actually care about them. Those are three different kinds of empathy. They're based in different parts of the brain. And if you have all three of those, people are going to naturally like you. And they're going to like you as a leader. They're going to like you as a colleague, as a teammate. And if you don't have that, no matter how smart you are, you're not going to get along very well with it. Yeah. So I can see I'm observing you, too. And I think this is interesting. I'm going to give you an observation that I'm certain that you've said what you just said to me in some way, shape or form thousands of times. Right? Because this is what you're an expert on. And a lot of people have questions about this. So there's no way that this is new information that you're thinking of, like, from the top top of your head, right? Oh, no, it's totally familiar. Absolutely. Yeah, Yeah. so it's totally familiar. And yet, Uh there's not an ounce of you that seems to me like you're just rotely going through your what you need to say. And it's just so I feel like you're very much present with me and actually really thinking about what you're saying and not just si- repeating something that you oh, don't even have to think about anymore. So oh, that I think is, interesting. it is interesting uh-huh. because I don't uh-huh. think that it's that common. I think when somebody has, is so used to saying the same concept or explaining sure. the same concept over and over, they yeah. have like a script almost in their head and it just comes out, but it doesn't seem like that when you're saying it to me. Oh, well, mm. Carol, let me ask you, when you write for WebMD, do you think about the person reading it, how to pitch it, uh, how, to, how to say it so that someone understand or find it interesting? Yeah, I think that's an interesting question. And I remember when I was learning, you should really picture the reader and be talking right. to one that's specific right. reader, whoever that reader yeah. is, you choose. To me, I find, I don't picture a reader, but I do know that I make, I'm trying to make it as simple and clear and human as if you or anybody else who I know or don't know is sitting in front of me and I'm I'm speaking it to them in that way. So I'm trying to say it as a human would say it, but very simply. Very good. Yeah. And that's what I do. You know, and I think being a journalist helped me with that because I was constantly thinking about, you know, why would anybody want to hear this? Who am I talking to? And so when I talk to you, I'm not just talking to you, I'm talking to everyone who listens to your podcast. And I, I think I'm unconsciously imagining who that might be oh, and what might be interesting to them about any of this. That's interesting. And I think that does come across. And I think that came across to me, as I said, when I heard you on Dax Shepard's podcast, I do feel like, yes, there was what you were saying. You took the time to explain concepts in a way that was like fascinating, fascinating to me as, and I'm not him, right? So you weren't just talking to him, which is also Mm -hmm. very different from how I run my, or how I do my interviews, right? Because I'm very much about the person I'm talking to in the moment. Like I'm very Mm -hmm. connected. And that's why I usually prefer in person because we're there together, right? So, but there is a place for both of those things, I think. And I think it could be, you know what I'm saying? Like there's, both are oh, good. Yeah. Well, I think if you have both, it defines rapport. That, you know, if you're really there with the other person and the other person is there with you, then you're really connected. I yeah. love that. Now, do you find when you're being interviewed that you have that, you see that mostly or mostly not? Um. I like to connect, like with you or with Dax, I like to connect with the person that I'm talking to. There is a problem on Zoom, by the way. I don't know if you find this. Uh, When you don't do a person-to-person interview, it has to do with eye contact. Eye contact is so important 
for connecting, for chemistry, for rapport. People communicate a huge amount of emotion around their eyes. And the, the, my computer screen is misdesigned for Zoom. Mm-hmm. The camera should be right in the middle of your eyes. Yes. It's not. It's at the top. And your face is below. And so I can't quite, if I'm having on cam- contact with your picture, I'm not looking at the camera. So you don't think I'm looking at you. If I'm looking at the camera, I'm not picking up what your eyes are telling me. So it's a little bit of a disconnect. You know, there's this spectrum of connection, disconnection mm-hmm. in electronic communication. Face to face is what our brain is designed for. That's what it brain assumes is happening. Zoom is good, but as I say, it's not perfect. But you can watch the person's face. You get the voice. Phone is not bad because a voice has lots of emotional messaging. Text is awful. Text is the worst. The reason is that there's no emotional cues with text. They're very And emojis kind of help, but not enough. It's not like moment to moment to moment to moment. Okay, so let's talk about all of this because I know exactly what you're talking about. And that's what, so I've tried to play around with this on Zoom because I used to only do in-person interviews before the pandemic. And then mm-hmm. the pandemic happened. And be, for that reason, for the connection reason, right? People, sure. sometimes a publicist sure. would ask, hey, can they do this remote? And I'd say, no, in person right. only. And then I had to. So, you know, you have pivot. And I'm glad that I did. I'm, I'm thankful that I got to keep going with this the whole time. So I don't even realize I'm doing it until I just noticed myself doing it. Maybe you do or maybe you don't. Right now, I'm looking at you through the camera. Right. I have, so I played around with this. I had an actress on. Her name is Betsy Brandt. She was in Breaking Bad. Did you see that? Breaking Bad? No. Okay. Big TV show. She played no, uh, a good part in it. So she, I noticed when I interviewed her on Zoom, that she had the greatest eye contact of anybody on Zoom. And I said, you're like, are you looking in the camera instead of at me or whatever? I didn't say it in a rude way like that, but I think yeah. I, I noted her eye uh-huh. contact. And she said that that she has been practicing looking straight into the camera for Zoom because she feels like it makes a difference for other people. So to me, I read people. So I feel like I need to look at you, right? I need to look at the picture Mm. on Zoom. Mm. And if I'm looking at the camera, then I'm not able to really read you. But at the same time, I wanna communicate that I am fully there with you. So I have been playing around with it here and there. So I think that what Uh I've fallen into the habit of doing is when I'm doing the talking, I will look at the camera. Like right now I'm looking at the camera, but then when you start to talk or when I am looking for a reaction, I will look back down at the computer. It's weird. And I think that's as good as you can get on Zoom. If you were with me and I was with you and in person, we could look at each other's eyes all the time. All the time. Which means we're picking up because the social brain, the social networks in the brain are constantly picking up moment to moment to moment, instant, unconscious, automatic information from the other person, particularly emotional information. How what I'm saying right now impacts the, what the other person, how they're reacting. And that tells you what to say next or what, you know, don't say that, say this. It keeps everything right spot on. One of the problems with um, electronic communication is that there's a lot of misunderstanding and miscommunication, particularly, as I said, in text. If you only text, then you can have what people call flaming. You know flaming? Wait, wait, what's flaming? You're really upset. Okay, so you're upset. It's your, your emotions have hijacked you and you furiously type out a message and you hit send and then you think, oh my God, why did I say that? Why did I do that? You know, my yeah. advice is always never send email late at night or after you've been drinking <laughs> because you're going to be more likely to flame. Right. You know, you want to when you feel over. when you feel a little yeah. when you feel angry or like or whatever. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And there's a technical reason that this happens. It's called, forgive the jargon, cyber disinhibition. What's not inhibited 
is the impulse to say or do that thing that's going to upset the other person. The reason it's not inhibited is that the brain's not getting that instantaneous feedback from the other person face to face. Like if I say that or do it, that person's going to get upset. You don't even have to think about it. Your brain does it for you automatically, unconsciously. If you're face to face, person to person. But if there's if you're texting, think about it. You don't see the other person. There's no other person present. It's just you and your feelings. Yeah, and you don't even know if they're reading it. You don't even know. They're not even there at the same time as you, right? It's like it's just you. Exactly. It's just you. Yeah. So be careful. I see that. So phone, let's talk about phone. You said something interesting about that too. So I like to talk on the phone, you know, certain times, Mm -hmm. especially like I could easily talk on the phone. It's great. It feels relaxed. And I do Mm -hmm. feel like I'm connecting with somebody without seeing them. Of course. However, and like, especially, you know, I talk to my parents for a long time also on the phone. Mm -hmm. If I talk, if Mm -hmm. I call my mom, I basically have no choice. She's going to have a million things. She's going to keep me on for like an hour. And it's not like I never talk to her. (laughs) Mom, I know you're listening to this. So Uh that's note about you. She knows it too. (laughs) But aside from like my real life, friends or family here's a little inside inside uh information for webmd these cover stories that i've done they're all phoners they're called phoners right so they're phone interviews mostly because that's just how they've always done them for the cover stories for the celebrity interviews and also because Typically, the people I was interviewing were on the West Coast, right? They were in California, and here I was on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. Now, I have done these long cover stories about people, and I've talked at length with them. They've shared things with me for an hour, you know, a good hour, one-on-one. And yet, I feel as though the guests who I've had on my show... I know so much better. Like, we really know each other. I don't forget... In, in person, person or even even on oh, Zoom, phone. even on Zoom, believe on it or Zoom. not, yeah. but not sure. phone. I feel like when I think about the oh, people I've interviewed phone. on the phone, interesting, interesting, but only for an interview. So maybe you can analyze that because, I, I, again, it's really only when I've interviewed people. But again, that Zoom has felt. I have felt like I've really connected, not with yeah. everybody. More so in person, obviously. But when I think about all the people who've been on the show, the vast majority, I feel like I know them well, you know, relatively. They know me, and it was a real human interaction, whereas I feel like I never even met the people who I had these phone interviews with. It's weird. With one exception. what's missing? What's that? Who's the exception? Talia Shire. Do you know who she is? (laughs) Yes, I do, of course. Okay. So Talia Shire... You know, she had, didn't know Zoom at the time that I had uh-huh. interviewed her, which was over the summer, this past summer. And so the uh, her publicist and I, we arranged a phone interview. But we liked each other a lot on the phone. Oh. And then I convinced her to do a follow-up on Zoom. And so we did a Zoom <laughs> after that. So we did so kind of become Zoom. friends after that. But she's the only exception that I can say to a phone interview. What's that about? So what's missing on the phone is the face. And what the face does is communicate most emotion. Tone of voice gives you some, but the face gives you much, much more. So So even though I got the information that they spoke to me, right, they told me things about themselves. You didn't get the feeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. And you didn't get somehow. uh, Let's think about this. Interesting, because uh, there's also memory for the face. Memory for the voice goes in a different part of the brain than memory for the face. Okay. So you, when you recall a conversation with someone you've Zoomed with or been with, you get the face. You don't get it on the phone. I wonder if that's part of it. I think that's and part it, of it. By the way, this is just supposition. I have no idea. Yeah, so you're really winging it right now. You're insight. winging it, but when you just said yeah. it, it did feel accurate to me. Like I felt like... You're absolutely right. I can't. I'm picturing a person who I've seen right. pictures of, right? When I think about when I look at Padma, for example, when I picture her in my brain, my conversation right. with her, um, uh-huh. I quickly pictured an image I had of her from a magazine. Or a, it's funny because it could even be the WebMD picture that ran with the article that I saw later. But I picture right. that now, or I picture where I was sitting when I interviewed her. I remember the chair I was sitting in. What's that about? <laughs> but that's a visual. 
Yeah. You're picturing the chair. So what that says to me is that perhaps your visual memory is key for you in feeling you know a person. Okay, you just made me think of one other thing. I think you're right. Ready? This You can help me figure this out. I've mentioned this before on What's the show. That? Very often, I if I'm reminded of a conversation that I've heard somebody have on a podcast, mm-hmm. I will quickly go back to, because I usually, I listen to podcasts most mornings, like take my dog for a really long walk, pop mm-hmm. in a podcast, and that's what, that's what happens most mornings. So most podcast conversations I hear are walking my dog, Stella. So if <laughs> I'm reminded of a conversation, I will instantly remember where I was walking when the person said that That's particular right. thing. That's right. And I walk yeah. similar routes almost every day. I have like maybe five different routes I take. And yet I can but still remember. What you heard at that point. So what that, what that tells me is that you're cueing the information to a visual peg. And that also fits with something else I heard, which is that when you read something online, you don't remember it as well as when you read it on a printed page because your memory for that fact is is tied to where on the page you saw it. In other words, memory is partly visual. So that's what you're saying when you walk your dog. And I go to that camellia bush and I remember what I heard at the camellia bush. That's exactly right. That's what I do all the time, but that does make sense. I've always been like, is it, does everybody do this or is this just a weird thing? And I brought it up a few times and I don't think anybody else does. Actually, my daughter, I think, said that, that sometimes she does that too. She does that. Yeah. Uh-huh. So maybe some people have that kind of memory and others don't. Huh. I don't know. It's very interesting. <laughs> You've got interesting. some intriguing hypotheses. We need graduate students to investigate them. <laughs> oh, that would be so great. I would love that. That's right. Let's figure out and get to the bottom of that. But that is interesting. They're all too, the hypotheses. Whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but very, it's funny because yeah. I would have figured that. I mean, every, it just shows you that everybody is unique, right? Everybody is different. And the, the way that we remember things or do things, it changes all the time because, again, you're such an expert in this field that I feel like you would have been exposed to everything already. But it just shows you that people are endlessly, they're unlimited in terms oh, no. of what they're experiencing. There's so much to know. You know, we know so little compared to what there is to know. Yeah, well, they say also, right, the more that you know, more not intelligent, I guess, but the more you learn in life, more the more you realize how little you know, how little you know, exactly, right? Somebody yeah. said that is that an actual quote from somebody really uh, a notable person? I don't that I don't I'm not even I think, crediting it's, with I think that. it's just a it may be, but it feels like a maxim to me. We've heard it so often. We don't know who said it. Yeah, first, right. Maybe somebody did. Yeah. Right. So emotional intelligence can you go through a few of the i don't want you to explain everything but a few of the main components is that what you call them components well no. i i think there are four parts basically okay one is self-awareness which means you know what you're feeling now and why you're feeling it and how it affects how you think and perceive and what you do uh it's very important for example in the workplace how it affects your performance uh, there's managing your emotions, using that awareness to handle your disturbing emotions so you can keep doing what you're doing, even though you might be a little upset about something, and stay positive, be adaptable, uh, keep your eye on your goal despite setbacks, all of that, which is the positive part of emotions. There's empathy, tuning into people. Uh, We talked about the three kinds of empathy, knowing how the person thinks and how they're feeling and actually caring about the person too. That's important. And then putting that all together to have effective relationships, to be able to be a great collaborator, you know, the kind of person people would have fun with and can get things done with, to be a good team player, to be a good leader, to be influential, to be uh, inspiring, to resonate with people. Uh, Those are all different aspects of emotional intelligence. Yeah, it's so interesting. And you can teach them all, I guess, right? Like we were talking about before, like when I asked you, some people do some people have them more naturally. And we were talking about women versus men with certain situations. But part of it, I think, also is, don't you sort of feel like 
people who are willing to learn and who would be interested in the topic or the idea of emotional intelligence already have emotional intelligence? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> maybe they do, maybe they don't. <laughs> uh, they may be quite, people I think are generally, as we said, there's a profile. You can uh -huh. be really strong in something and not so good in another thing. Mm -hmm. And the good news is that actually, yes, you're right. People can learn to get better at any of this. Right. Uh, the, these are basic human skills. and. If you're one of the reasons, for example, that people might be poor at empathy is we usually don't get any feedback on whether we're right or wrong about what we think other people are thinking or feeling. So one way to amp that up is to give someone feedback about it. Let them say, well, I, I sense you're feeling this, or maybe you're thinking that, or you see it this way or that way. And am I right or am I wrong? You know, the brain wants to know. There's this... A uh, fellow uh, who designed a, a way to read emotions. It's like a 45 minute online learning app. And it, the brain gets better and better at it. The brain wants to learn this stuff. It just never has, rarely has the opportunity. You know, when you're raising kids, for example, when your kids were little and had a tantrum or were crying, and you picked them up and you soothe them you are actually teaching them how to calm themselves. And the more you did it, okay. the better they got at it because they were learning the skill. And then eventually they could do it themselves. Right, so that's the opposite of the concept of like let them figure out how to self-soothe, I guess, right? By, by giving them soothing, they're figuring out how to self-soothe. Well, I think there's a point where you want to let them do it on their own. Uh-huh. So you, you don't want to let them self, I, I think you're helping them learn when they're infants and maybe when they're toddlers, you, you let them learn to self-soothe. Uh, but basically, bottom line, parents are your first coaches in emotional intelligence. You learn it from your siblings and your parents and your, then your friends in, in school. And so on. I'm a big advocate, by the way, of teaching uh, emotional intelligence to kids in school. They call it oh, social yes. emotional learning. Yes. There are hundreds of programs. You know about it? So yeah. it's funny it's that you- I think it's real. I wanna know, I wanna talk about that because I feel like you, so I heard you talking about that. I think you mentioned it, hmm. again, going back to Dax's podcast, because like the week mm -hmm. before I had a guest, I had a guest on my podcast He's an actor, his name is Josh Radner, and he was in How I Met Your Mother. I know you don't watch it, I feel like you don't watch much TV, but people listening will know who I'm talking about, so I'm gonna say it was Josh Radner. And he and I were talking about how understanding how your thinking impacts yourself, your choices, mm. your relationships, it's so key, and nobody really teaches that. I mean, certain families will teach it, right? Like we were saying, you'll get that from your parents, maybe. They'll teach you how to understand mm -hmm. your emotions. But by and large, like, there's nothing like that out there. And I said to him, I feel like there should be a class. And he said, yeah, there should be a class. Like, kids should have this. And then like a day or two later, I'm listening. And I'm t I know exactly what part of the street I was on when you were saying that. You <laughs> I was like, you said about about the, what is it, SEL? Am I getting it right? Yeah, social emotional learning. And I was like, and it teaches That's kids it. this stuff. Yeah. Well, they're different levels. So kids learn how to calm down. They learn how to listen, how to care about other kids. They learn basically how to be well-behaved, good kids. And it, you know, every parent wants their kids to know this, but it, they teach it consistently, kindergarten to the time they graduate high school. So they really get it. Uh, and the data on it is really fantastic. Kids like school more they don't bully as much and they do better academically it's really good stuff so i'm a, a big advocate there's another level though that you might get from a coach or a therapist which is how your thought patterns which are shaped in childhood are affecting your romantic relationships mm -hmm. or your any relationship as you're an adult now i have to recommend my wife's book, Tar Bennett Goldman, a book called Emotional Alchemy, which integrates cognitive therapy with mindfulness. And it has like 10 very common thinking patterns, like uh, emotional deprivation. I never get enough uh, caring in my life. 
for self-sacrifice. I'm always giving too much of myself and people don't care about me. Or perfectionism. I've got to keep doing it until I get it better than anybody else. All of these are really common thought patterns and they drive us, but we don't realize how they're impacting us in our lives negatively. Like you may be uh, top of your game because you're a perfectionist, but oh, by the way, you don't have any life. You know, you can't have a relationship that lasts. You don't have fun, you know, because you know, you're working all the time. So yeah. it's in a way it's rewarded, but you don't see the negatives in that. So anyway, I, I think it's really important to understand your thought patterns. Absolutely. I agree. And so those are, they're self-narratives, right? It's, it's negative self-talk exactly. that you tell yourself and you start it normally. And this is a therapist. This was a big thing for sure. me was helping people sure. see, understand and read their self-narrative and see how flawed it really was. So a lot of times we think things and we just accept them as facts and narratives. Like you tell yourself these things i'm not good enough or of whatever else or i always do i'm always sacrificing and i never get what i need these are things you tell yourself even though they may be faulty but the the big thing is being aware of it and then you can actually change it you can shift exactly it. change the aware. narrative if you're exactly. aware that exactly. was always that's like for me you asked me at the beginning what was my um background or was my therapy approach and it was really awareness was the key so it's like for each new person who i'm surfacing seeing, your self-talk like, which yeah yeah because it's usually unconscious yeah you're telling yourself this it's like yes. this background voice and and it's All the directing time. you you're like a little puppet of this exactly that's but right. if you become aware of it then you can do something about it you have a choice point Exactly. And it's amazing how that's, that's easy great. it is to shift it really when you to shift everything in your life or certain things in your life once you are a aware and b do something to change it and then it's like that new self-narrative there it's a, not you know it does happen where you regress a little bit here and there but you really can it change it impacts everything it's so powerful so yeah. i'm always yeah. after that getting <laughs> becoming aware first and then yeah doing something about it so well you, talking back to your self-talk very powerful talking very back powerful. to your self-talk yes exactly exactly yeah. so let's let uh, if nothing else let, let's let everybody try that at home right <laughs> practice that at home Not, don't try this at home but do try this at home understand what you're home. Yeah. what you're telling yourself yeah. right this, this is why it's it's useful to work with a coach or a therapist because sometimes you know it's it's a little difficult to do on your own it's good to have someone to remind you and to encourage you, particularly when you don't do it, you mess up, then you might give up. But if you have someone who can help you see that this was a, maybe there's an opportunity to learn something for the next time. Yeah. And it, of course, if you go into therapy or you hire a coach and you feel like that's the thing that you're supposed to be doing, mm. but you're not really in it mentally or emotionally, oh. then nothing's going to happen. It's true. You have to really commit to change. And it's a little difficult. I mean, it's it's very comfortable being who we've always been, and it's a little, it's outside our comfort zone to be someone else. Right. So, if you were to recommend, like, a so this is good too because you have all of this expertise and background and everything science behind you, but you also like to read WebMD and you also have Psychology Today <laughs> in your background. So, if you were to recommend one or two self help books to just kind of in general that you feel like have helped a lot of people, they're good. What, what would you pick? Uh, well, I mentioned my wife's book, uh, Emotional Alchemy. It's actually very helpful. I would also recommend, um, I'm trying to remember the name. He was a student of Aaron Beck, who wrote a book about exactly this, about monitoring and getting to know your thinking patterns and then how to work with them. Uh, and by the way, Aaron Beck's book on depression and anxiety is very good, too. And he wrote another book for couples called Love is Never Enough, which I think is a very useful book. OK, now Aaron these are Beck. older books, right? Are they old books? These are classics. They're classics. classics. Yes. I remember studying Beck. Right. And oh, Beck, yes. tell me if I'm if I'm remembering this correctly. Was he sort of the father of cognitive behavioral therapy? He was. Or cognitive. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 
Well, they, sometimes it's called CBT, cognitive behavioral, sometimes yeah. just cognitive therapy. But I also remember he that was there was behavioral therapy, you know, which was different before. from before. And then yeah. it was like they combined the, the CBT, and that's, and just that's for, right. for everybody, for everybody listening to know, CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy has been shown to be very effective. Like has, there is research backing CBT for a lot of mental health conditions, yeah. anxiety being one of them, depression. Well, well, what do you think about that? Well, the, the newest um, version of that is mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. The mindfulness helps you be more self-aware. Mm -hmm. So you can catch your self-talk, for example, see how it's driving you. Then the cognitive therapy part of it helps you change it. As I said, talk back to yourself, talk. Yeah. And I, I think that combination is very powerful. And the, the data is showing that mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, MBCT, is very, very effective for a whole range of problems. So I, I'd recommend any, any book about that, and there are lots okay. of them. So the two, and the two big recommendations for today, I feel like, are now we just recommended mindfulness-based uh, CBT and, of course, meditation. There you right? go. <laughs> so, well, Dan, this has been such a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for sharing all of your insights and everything. I'm sure we could have talked about a million other topics. There's so much that everybody who's listening and watching, because you know they will watch too. Oh, I see. I should have told you that from the beginning. Again, I assumed that you knew that, but oh, are you okay being I would have, I would have dressed up if I knew. <laughs> you look this, great. This has been a great pleasure. Thank you so much. It, it's a joy to be on your podcast. That was Dan Goleman, PhD, and my neighbor. Check out his podcast, First Person Plural. Read up on emotional intelligence at dangoleman.info. And please place your orders on Amazon through my link, amazon.com slash shop slash really famous. It's a great way to support the show and me, and I appreciate it. Thanks for listening. Thanks for analyzing life, people, and me with Dan Goleman, and I look forward to talking to you again very soon.